Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Liam XML bringing you that next level fire. We've maintained a large, diverse amount of content over the years, and I think it's of critical importance that we begin the process of teaching and reteaching and educating one another. And I've spent so much time dedicating myself to the process of learning that I think it is in <clears throat> there is no better time than now to come with, to you with the information that I've gained. So without further ado, let us begin. So first off, we will begin with a video from the channel Spirit Science. And what will be the point of this watching this video? We're going to get to we're going to get we're going to get to have the chance to learn about the flower of life and what the flower of life really is. What the science behind the entirety of the flower of life is. And this will give everybody a chance to learn what it is in fact we're studying. In short, before we go into the great depths of it. In the universe is geometric. Whether it's people, trees, cats, planets, Solar systems, stars, you name it. Anything in the universe can be measured on a geometric scale. Having said that, it's important to note that creation is also geometric. What we're going to be looking at today is the pattern of creation. Essentially what this means is that everything in the universe comes out of this single pattern. I'm not making this up. This single image will change everything. When I mentioned in Lesson 5 that the ancient Egyptians and even more ancient civilizations knew about a deeper, basic understanding of the universe, this is the flower of life. And it is also the creation pattern of everything in existence. Even non-tangible things, emotions, thoughts, music in its entire spectrum, everything comes from this image. Okay, so there are 13 information systems that comes out of the flower of life. There are 13 information systems that come out of the flower of life. You heard that correct? Let's continue. Today, I'm going to show you how physical reality can manifest itself, which is just one of 13 systems. In future lessons, we will look at more. It's also important to note that, at first, it may not make sense. I ask that you do not choose immediately to shut this out, and just watch with an open mind, and try and see this in a new way. Also, I'll tell you that by learning about sacred geometry simply by observing, you are absorbing only a very minuscule amount of information. If you really want to learn more, you must begin to draw it yourself. I you have to begin to draw it yourself. By drawing it yourself, you unlock energy and information that has been encoded into the very fabric of these shapes. You don't understand the power of drawing these symbols. You're physically actualizing in them in your particular file or defile system. Kid not. When you, you begin to see things in a new way, you begin to understand why things are done in the way that they are done. Promise. The flower of life was known around the world in ancient times. It was found in Ireland, Turkey, Israel, Egypt, China, Greece, Germany, India, and Iceland. It's also been recorded to have been found in England, Tibet, Japan, Sweden. Sweden, this symbol is planetary in its very nature. Lapland, the Yucatan, and I think 14 other places. This thing is everywhere. Not only that, but everywhere around the world it has the same name, the flower of life. Now, to understand the flower of life, first we have to talk about how it's formed. This could get incredibly complex, so I'll try and keep it simple. Imagine consciousness, or spirit, floating in a void, which means it's nothingness, and then spirit. No physical body or mind, just spirit, and that's it. Then blackness, essentially nothing, all around the spirit, for infinite. Spirit decides to do something, so it expands it. This is the very nature of spirit and its own behavior. 
manifesting and observe it, observing itself. It's consciousness all around itself as far as it can go without moving. It creates a sphere around itself. This is the first circle in the flower of life. Then, spirit has an awareness of what's around itself in 360 degrees. It moves to the very edge of the sphere anywhere and repeats what it did the first time. It creates this image, which also creates the Vesica Pisces. Within the Vesica Pisces is a vast and incredible amount of knowledge about width, proportion, depth. Also comes the square roots of two, three, and five, which are all numbers that go on forever. But even more interestingly, comes geometric information about light. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, inside of light is encoded information, information that has its own ability to interact and communicate with the information that operates inside of you and is you. Spirit has no choice but to do it again. Spirit is flawless, and therefore it will move flawlessly, creating the next circle either here or here, exactly one radius away from the other circle next to it. Every time spirit moves another sphere, more and more knowledge comes out of the image that is created. The first complete image to be formed is this. It has two names, the seed of life, or the Genesis pattern, and for good reason. Now, let's look at the book of Genesis for a second. Each of these movements or creations of circles can be seen as another day. On the first movement, the second sphere, it creates knowledge about not only mathematical proportions, but light. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The first sentence of Genesis says, the earth was without form and void, and that the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. In the very next sentence, God says, let there be light. The key here is in the order. The movement happened first, then light happened immediately after. Well, but what about the waters? Well, you have to remember that the Bible has been changed over time a lot. The ancient Egyptians would say that the way our modern Bibles begin creation is impossible, especially if you think about it from a physics point of view. Imagine a dark, infinite space that goes on forever and ever in all directions. You're just floating there with nothing. You can't really fall, but where would you Right. Let's continue listening to this. We're breaking this down. This is spirit science's introduction to the concepts of the ancient secret of the flower of life. We're going to continue on from here. We are allowing spirit science to provide a brief introduction as to accompany our lesson here. So thank you very much for watching. This is Liam Exmo, your host. You fall to. From a purely physics or mathematical point of view, motion itself or kinetic energy is absolutely impossible in a void. You can't even rotate because motion cannot become real unless there is one other object in the space around you. So the ancient Egyptians would say that before God moved upon the face of the waters, it would first have to create something to move relative to. So, Genesis pattern. After three spheres, you get the Holy Trinity. Another interesting one, it says in many Bibles of the world, not just the Christian Bible, that on the fourth day of Genesis, exactly one half of creation was completed. Starting from the first motion, exactly one half of the circles were formed on the fourth day. Fifth day of Genesis, sixth circle, more information. And then on the sixth day... So again, there's not much to break down to this. It's very simple. It's very direct in what it's saying. So just continue to allow this to be an introduction to the lesson that we will, we will be covering today. A geometric miracle takes place. The last soul forms a complete six-petaled flower. This is what many earlier Bibles meant when they said, in the beginning there were six. Our Bible even said creation was formed in six days, and this fits exactly. This is the pattern of Genesis, and so it's called the Genesis pattern. It's also the beginning of the creation of the universe that we live in. These original movements of spirit are really important, but now let's look at something even cooler. Another image that comes out of this pattern is this. It's called the Tree of Life. Many recognize this as the Jewish or Hebrew Kabbalah, but the Kabbalah did not originate this image, and there is proof. The Tree of Life does not belong to any culture, not even the Egyptians who carved the Tree of Life on two sets of three pillars at Karnak Temple Luxor over 5,000 years ago. It's outside any race or religion, as with all of these images. There are patterns that are into- Right, ra race and religion, both of those are both our words that are used to, as constructs to retard our mindsets and to arrest our consciousness and our state of development. ...connected with nature. You'll also notice that every circle on the Tree of Life is either the length or width of the Vesica Pisces. The second image beyond Genesis in the Flower of Life is the Egg of Life. This is formed during the second vortex motion. Upon its completion, it creates an image like this, a three-dimensional shape that you can hold in your hand. If you were to connect their centers, you would see a cube. So what? Who cares? Well, the ancient Egyptian did, because they were concerned with creation, life, and death. They called this cluster of spheres the Egg of Life. You probably won't believe me just yet, but this shape is the morphogenic structure that created your body. Your entire physical- Yes, most people will not believe it at this point, but it is very beautiful that Spirit Sciences and their production companies have taken the liberty to provide us with the Im 
the illustration as it has. This is just beginning level. It is also important to say that at the egg of life level, we begin to understand that all of the flower of life in itself is a three-dimensional, four-dimensional, dimensional, five-dimensional, six-dimensional, seventh-dimensional, eighth-dimensional, ninth-dimensional, tenth-dimensional, eleventh-dimensional, and twelfth-dimensional construct. Potentially beyond, but these are all things to keep in mind at all times regarding the relationship of this, this shape and structure. Thank you. Physical existence is dependent on the egg of life structure, and everything about you was created from that form. Everything from your eye color to how long your fingers are? This is a whole lesson on its own, so let's move on for now. All around the world, the flower of life was always made the exact same way. See, this pattern can clearly go on forever. However, they always, always stopped after 19 circles. After 19 circles, could that mean that there's a reference into how many dimensions there could potentially be right there? Let's not digress. Let's just keep moving forward with an introduction to the presentation of the flower of life. Why? Well, because they didn't want you to see what I'm about to show you. Back then, this image and knowledge was so sacred that they couldn't allow it to become common knowledge. It was appropriate at that time. However, now we either use the information or fall further in darkness. In biology, all cells have a zona pellucida around the edge. These circles around the flower of life are the zona pellucida of the flower of life. You must remove these, then complete the sphere that were cut off by the zona pellucida. With one more step, you will have the secret. Finish the drawing, add the final missing circles, giving you this. This image is the fruit of life. This pattern of 13 circles is one of the holiest, most sacred forms in existence. It's called the fruit because it is the result, the fruit, from which the fabric of the details of the reality were created. And we're going to cover this in greater depth and detail, and it's going to be at length, so please continue to enjoy. We certainly do appreciate your presence, but we're not going to provide too many more greetings. Thank you very much for your attendance this evening. Remember when we talked about male and female energy, lesson four? As you can see, this image is female. It has no straight lines. However, when you combine male lines with these female circles, something amazing happens. What you do is draw a straight line from the very center of every single circle to every other circle in this image. When you do this, you get an image which is known throughout the universe, everywhere, as Metatron's cube. It is one of the most important informational systems in the universe, one of the basic creation patterns in existence. So what is Metatron's cube? Well, anyone who has studied sacred geometry, or even regular geometry for that matter, knows that there are five unique shapes in the universe, and that they are crucial to understanding both regular and sacred geometry. They are called the platonic solids. A platonic solid has certain characteristics by definition. First of all, all of its faces are the same size. For example, a cube, the most well-known platonic solid, has a square on every face, so all of its faces are the same size. Secondly, the edges... Yep, let's continue. Wonderful introduction of spirit science and the flower of life. ...of the platonic solids are all the same length. All edges of the cube are the same length. Third, it only has one size of interior angles between the faces. In the case of the cube, this angle is 90 degrees. And fourth, when put inside of a sphere, all of the points will touch the edge of the sphere perfectly. With that definition, there are only four shapes besides the cube that fit that description. So what are they? Well, we have the dodecahedron, the tetrahedron, the octahedron, the isosahedron, and the hexahedron. All of these shapes are found within Metatron's cube. This knowledge is also where original alchemy came from. The ancient alchemists and great souls like Pythagoras, father of Greece, considered each shape to have an elemental aspect to them. The tetrahedron was considered fire, the cube was earth, the octahedron was air, the isosahedron was water, and the dodecahedron was ether. Ether, also known as Beginning to understand the nature of these elements in their basic and raw and primitive forms. The elemental nature of these energy systems. As prana and tachyon energy are all the same thing. They extend anywhere and are accessible at any point in space, time, and dimension. This is the great secret of zero-point technology. The sphere is voidness. These six elements are the building blocks of the universe, and they create the qualities of the universe. To summarize, this is the first informational system that comes out of the fruit of life through Metatron's cube. In alchemy, they rarely discussed ether. I've read that in the Pythagorean school, if you even uttered the word dodecahedron outside of the school, they would kill you on the spot. That's how sacred this shape was. 200 years later, when Plato was alive, he would discuss it, but only very carefully. This is because the dodecahedron is near the outer edge in your energy field and is the highest form of consciousness. There's quite a bit more here, but I don't think I can go much further on it right now. Anyways, recognize this? The periodic table of elements? Every single element on the- Have any of you ever seen the periodical table of elements? Did you know that Ether was one time, at one time considered to be an element that should be placed on the periodical table of elements. The very nature of the periodical ta table of elements was to describe the ether and the energy therein. So let's continue considering the nature of what we're observing. On this table, geometric relation to one of these five shapes. 
Modern scholars ridiculed this idea until the 1980s, when Professor Robert Moon at the University of Chicago demonstrated that the entire periodic table of elements, literally everything in the physical world, is based on these same five forms. In fact, throughout modern physics, chemistry, and biology, the sacred geometric patterns of creation are being rediscovered. Another example is the egg of life that I showed you earlier. Hopefully that will help you to understand just how incredible and important of a discovery this truly is. Everything that modern science knows about the elements and reality are tied together through the platonic solids, which come out of the Metron's cube, which is formed out of the fruit of life, which comes from the flower of life, which is made by spirit. Damn. Whether you're convinced yet or not, this is the missing piece of the puzzle. It all comes down to spirit. Don't forget, this is just one of 13 informational systems that created the universe. If you want to study this on depth in your own, the best resource I'm aware of is the book, The Ancient Secret of the Flower of Life. And that's where we're All right, next. I'm gonna wrap up with something I think you'll enjoy. Do you believe in aliens? Even after lesson five, I realize many of you might be skeptical. Would you believe me if I flat out told you that aliens have been coming to earth and helping us for a very long time now? No? How about now? This is the flower of life in a crop circle. Remember, the flower of life is not only tied to everything in the universe, but consciousness, spirit, as well. Here's another one, and another one. Here's the Vesica Pisces crop circle. By creating these crop circles, aliens have been actually affecting and helping the our energetic of the states. planet. Do not the fear consciousness aliens. has been They're being altered. See, these in symbols raise your consciousness. The very nature of these symbols here raise our consciousness system. And that's profound, is not? So, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to remove that source. And then I'm going to add a new source. A Garden of Pomegranates by Israel Rigardi, page one. It is ironic that a period of the most tremendous technological advancements known to recorded history should also be labeled the Age of Anxiety. Reams have been written about modern man's frenzied search for his soul, and indeed, his doubt that he even has one at a time, when like castles built on sand, so many of his cherished theories, long mistaken for ver verities, are crumbling about his bewildered brain. The age-old advice, know thyself, is more imperative than ever. The temple of science has accelerated to such a degree that today's discoveries frequently make yesterday's equations obsolescent. Almost before they can be chalked up on a blackboard. Small wonder then that every other hospital bed is occupied by a mental patient. Man was not constructed to spend his life at a crossroads, one of which leads he knows not where, and the other to threaten annihilation of his species. In view of this situation, it is doubly reassuring to know that even in the midst of chaotic concepts and conditions, there still remains a door through which man individually can enter into a vast storehouse of knowledge, knowledge as dependable and immutable as the measured tread of eternity. For this reason, I am especially pleased to be writing an introduction to a new edition of A Garden of Pomegranates. I feel that never perhaps was a need more urgent for just such a roadmap as the Kabbalistic system provides. It should be equally useful to any who choose to follow it, whether he be Jew, Christian, or Buddhist, Deist, Theosophist, Agnostic, or Atheist. The Kabbalah is a trustworthy guide, leading to a comprehension both of the universe and of one's own self.
Sages have long taught that man is a miniature of the universe, containing within himself the diverse elements of the macrocosm of which he is the microcosm. Within the Kabbalah is a glyph called the Tree of Life, which is at once a symbol symbolic map of the universe and its major aspects, and also of its smaller counterpart, man. Manly P. Hall, in The Secret Teaching of All Ages, deplores the failure of modern science to sense the profoundity of these philosophical deductions of the ancients. Were they to do so, he says, they would realize those who fabricated the structure of the Kabbalah possessed a knowledge of the celestial plan comparable in every respect with that of the modern savant. Fortunately, many scientists in the field of psychotherapy are beginning to sense this correlation. In Francis G. Wick's The Inner World of Choice, reference is made to the existence in every person of a galaxy of potentialities for growth marked by a succession of personological evolution and interaction with environments. She points out that man is not only an individual particle, but also a part of the human stream governed by a self greater than his own individual self. The Book of Law states simply, every man and every woman is a star. This is a startling thought for those who consider a star a heavenly body, but a declaration subject to proof by anyone who will venture into the realm of his own unconscious. This realm, he will learn if he persists, is not hemmed in by the boundaries of his physical body, but is one with the boundless reaches of outer space. Those who armed with the tools provided by the Kabbalah have made the journey within and crossed beyond the barriers of illusion, have returned with an impressive quantity of knowledge which conforms strictly to the definition of science. In Winston College's dictionary, science, a body of knowledge, general truths of particular facts, obtained and shown to be correct by accurate observation and thinking, knowledge condensed, arranged and systemized with reference to general truths and laws. Over and over, their findings have been confirmed, proving the Kabbalah contains within it not only the elements of the science itself, but the method with which to pursue it. When planning to visit a foreign country, the wise traveler will first familiarize himself with its language. In studying music, chemistry, or calculus, a specific terminology is essential to the understanding of each subject. So a new set of symbols is necessary when undertaking a study of the universe. Whether within or without, the Kabbalah provides such a set in unexcelled fashion. But the Kabbalah is more. It also lays the foundation on which rests another archaic science magic, not to be confused with the conjurer's sleight of hand. Magic has been defined by Alessier Crawley as the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. Diane Fortune qualifies this nicely with an added clause, changes in consciousness. The Kabbalah reveals the nature of certain physical and psychological phenomena. Once these are apprehended, understood, and correlated, the student can use the principles of magic to exercise control over life's conditions and circumstances not otherwise possible. In short, magic provides the practical application of the theories supplied by the Kabbalah. It serves yet another vital function. In addition to advantages to be gained from its philosophical application, the ancients discovered a very practical use for the literal Kabbalah. Each letter of the Kabbalistic alphabet has a number, color, many symbols, and a tarot card attributed to it. The Kabbalah may not only aid in an understanding of the tarot, but teaches the students how to classify and organize all such ideas, numbers, and symbols, just as a knowledge of Latin will give insight into the meaning of an unfamiliar English word with a Latin root, so the knowledge of the Kabbalah, with the various attributions to each character in its alphabet, will enable the student to understand and correlate ideas and concepts, which otherwise would have no apparent relation. We take pause here to, uh, to share with the student here listening now what this breaks down to. 
See, the, those who may speak Yiddish, the Jewish people themselves, those who are perhaps of Israeli descent, are part of the 12 tribes of the Hebrew Israelites. See, if you cannot see in color and hear in sound, if you cannot taste color, then you have not fully come to grasp the, the capabilities of our mind. One moment. There are those who see images inside of images. The drunken octopus effect. You know the coat rack that you hang your coat on at the end of the day? Some people equate that little object to look like a drunken octopus with his arms out, stretched out, and the, the screws for his eyes that mount him to be, in fact, his, the eyes of the drunken octopus. But some people see that in all elements of reality around them. It's a crossing of the senses, a crossing of, of the mind. The mind is able to, like seeing shapes in clouds. But there's also something beyond that. In the nature and the study of etymology, we study the meaning, the energy, the power in each word, each letter, each syllable, the way that this, the word is pronunciated, the sound generated. All these things are attached because words have power, but the sounds used to make up the words also contain power in themselves. So this is a study that the Jewish people find specialization in. And computer code and the very systems that make up the way we have created computers will also be able to be observed in similar fashion at some point someday. As we begin to expand and understand the very nature of what makes up a computer, how it functions, how it affects and interacts with reality. But those who already understand this language are going farther than our comprehension has yet allowed us to acquire and realize. They are going to a place as quickly as, as they can in order to utilize advanced quantum computing technology, robots, AI, general intelligence systems, they're using these to their advantage to further create a system of control all around us. So let us continue now. A simple example is the concept of the Trinity in the Christian religion. The student is frequently amazed to learn through a study of the Kabbalah that Egyptian mythology followed a similar concept with its trinity of gods, Osiris the father, Isis the virgin mother, and Horus the son. The Kabbalah indicates a similar correspondence in the pantheon of Roman and Greek deities, providing the father, mother, holy spirit, son principles of deity are primordial archetypes of man's psyche, rather than being, as is frequently and erroneously supposed, a development peculiar to the Christian era. At this juncture, let me call attention to one set of attributes by Rittengelius, usually found as an appendix attached to the Sefer Yetzira. It lists a series of intelligences for each one of the ten Sephiros and the twenty-two paths of the Tree of Life. It seems to me, after prolonged meditation, that the common attributions of these intelligences are altogether arbitrary and lacking in serious meaning. For example, Kessler is called the Admirable or the hidden intelligence, it is the primary glory, for no created being can attain to its essence. This seems perfectly all right. The meaning at first seems to fit the significance of Kesser as the first emanation from A in Sof. But there are half a dozen other similar attributions that would have served equally well. For instance, it could have been called the occult intelligence, usually attributed to the seventh path, or Sephirah. For surely Kesser is secret in a way to be said of no other Sephirah. And what about the absolute or perfect intelligence? That would have been 
even more explicit and appropriate, being applicable to Kesser far more than to any other path of the paths. Similarly, there, similarly, there is one attributed to the 16th path and called the eternal or triumphant intelligence, so called because it is the pleasure of the glory, beyond which is no glory like it. And it is called also the paradise prepared for the righteous. Any of these paths Any of these several would have done equally well. Very much. Sorry, somebody messaged me. <laughs> also, the paradise prepared for the righteous. Any of these several would have done equally well. Much is, much is true of so many of the other attributions in this particular area. Here, let me uh, close Skype. The other attributions in this particular area, that is, the so-called intelligences of the Sefer Yetzirah, I do not think that their use or current arbitrary usage stands up to serious examinations or criticisms. A good many attribu attributions in other symbolic areas, I feel, are subject to the same criticism. The Egyptian gods have been used with a good deal of carelessness and without sufficient explanation of motives in assigning them as I did. In a recent edition of Crawley's masterpiece, Liber 777, which off-fawn is less, less a reflection of Crawley's mind as a recent critic claimed than a tabulation of some of the material given piecemeal in the Golden Dawn Knowledge Lectures. He gives for the same for the first time brief explanations of the motives for his attributions. I too should have been far more explicit in the explanations. I use in the case of some of the gods whose names are were used many times, most inadequately, were several paths where several paths were concerned. While it is true that the religious coloring of the Egyptian gods differed from time to time during Egypt's turbulent history, nonetheless a word or two about just that one single point could have served a useful purpose. Some of the passages in the book force me to force me today to emphasize that so far as the Kabbalah is concerned, it could and should be employed without binding to it the partisan qualities of any one particular religious faith. This goes as much for Judaism as it does for Christianity. Neither has much intrinsic usefulness where the scientific scheme is concerned. If some students feel hurt by the statement, that cannot be helped. The day of most contemporary faiths is over. They have been more of a curse than a boon to mankind. Nothing that I say here, however, should reflect on the people's concern, those who accept these religions. They are merely unfortunate. The religion itself is worn out and indeed is dying. The Kabbalah has nothing to do with any of them. Attempts on the part of coldish partisans to impart higher mystical meanings through the Kabbalah, etc., to their now sterile faiths is futile, and will be seen as such by the younger generation. They, the flower, and love children will have none of this nonsense. That's how old this book is. So... I felt this a long time ago, as I still do, but even more so. The only way to explain the partisan Jewish attitude demonstrated in some small sections of the book can readily be explained. I have been reading some writings of Arthur Edward Waite and some of his... See, I have to see if this is reading outright real fast. Yep, it is. Okay. I felt this way... I felt this... A long time ago, as I still do, but even more so. The only way to explain the partisan Jewish attitude demonstrated in some small sections of the book can readily be explained. 
I had been reading some writings of Arthur Edward Waite, and some of his pomposity and turgidity stuck to my mantle. I disliked his patronizing Christian attitude, and so swung all the way over to the other side of the pendulum. Actually, neither faith is particularly important in this day and age. I must be careful never to read weight again before embarking upon literary work of my own. Much knowledge obtained by the ancients through the use of the Kabbalah has been supported by discoveries of modern scientists, anthropologists, astronomers, psychiatrists, etc. Ow. All these people learn Kabbalah. All learned Kabbalists for hundreds of years have been aware of what the psychiatrist has only discovered in the last few decades. That man's concept of himself, his deities, and the universe is constantly evolving, changing as man himself evolves on a higher spiral. But the roots of his concepts are buried in a rare consciousness. Excuse me. One second. I need to increase the size of this text real fast. There we go. All right. Much knowledge obtained by ancient Sioux, the use of the Kabbalah, has been supported by discoveries of modern scientists, anthropologists, astronomers, psychiatrists. Learned Kabbalists for hundreds of years have been aware of what the psychiatrist has only discovered in the last few decades, that man's concept of himself, his deities, and the universe is a constantly evolving process, changing as man himself evolves on a higher spiral, but the roots of his concepts are buried in a race consciousness that antedated Neanderthal man by uncounted eons of time. What Jung calls archetypal images constantly rise to the surface of man's awareness from the vast consciousness, unconscious that is the common heritage of all mankind. The tragedy of civilized man is that he is cut off from awareness of his own instincts. The Kabbalah can help him achieve the necessary understanding to effect a reunion with them, so that rather than being driven by forces he does not understand, he can harness for his conscious use the same power that guides the homing pigeon, teaches the beaver to build a dam, and keeps the planet revolving in their appointed orbits about the sun. I began the study of Kabbalah at an early age. Two books I read then have played unconsciously a prominent part in the writing of my own book. One of these was K QBL, or The Bride's Reception, by Frater Akkad, known as Charles Stansfield Jones, which I must have first read around 1926. The other was an introduction to Tarot by Paul Foster Case, published in the early 1920s. It is now out of print, superseded by later versions of the same topic. But as I now glance through this slender book, I perceive how profoundly even the format of this book has influenced me. Through in these two instances, there was not a trace of plagiarism. It had not consciously occurred to me until recently that I owed so much to them. Since Paul Case passed away about a decade or so ago, this gives me the opportunity to thank him overtly, wherever he may now be. By the middle of 1926, I had become aware of the work of Aleister Crawley, for whom I have a tremendous respect. I studied as many of his writings as I could gain access to, making copious notes, and later acted, acted for several years as his, as his secretary, having joined him in Paris on October 12, 1928, a, mem a memorable day in my life. All sorts of books have been written on the Kabbalah, some poor, some few others extremely good, but I came to feel the need for what might be called a sort of Berlitz handbook, a concise but comprehensive introduction studded with diagrams and tables of easily understood definitions and correspondences to simply the student's grasp of so complicated and obtrusive subject. During a short retirement in North Devon in 1931, I began to amalgamate my notes. It was out of these that a garden of pomegranates gradually emerged. I unashamedly admit that my book contains many direct plagiarisms from Crawley, Waite, Eliphas, Levi, and D. H. Lawrence. I had incorporated numerous fragments from their works into my notebooks without citing individual references to the various sources from which I condensed my notes. Prior to the closing down of the Mandrake Press 
in London about 1930 or 1931, I was employed as a company secretary for a while. Along with several Crowley books, the Magic Press published a lovely little monogram by D.H. Lawrence entitled Apropos of Lady Chatterley's Lover. My own copy accompanied me to, on my travels for long years. Only recently did I discover that it had been lost. I hope that any one of my former patients who had borrowed it will see fit to return it to me forthwith. The last chapter of A Garden deals with the way of return. It used almost entirely Crowley's concept of the path as described in his superb essay, One Star in Sight. In addition to this, I borrowed extensively from Lawrence's apropos. Somehow they all fitted together very nicely. In time, all these variegated notes were incorporated into the text without acknowledgement, an oversight which I now feel sure would be give, forgiven since I was only 24 at the time. Some modern nature, nature worshippers and members of the newly washed and redeemed witch cult have complimented me on this closing chapter which I entitled The Ladder. I am pleased about this. For, ve for a very long time, I was not at all familiar with the topic of witchcraft. I had avoided it entirely, not being attracted to its literature in any way. In fact, I only became slightly conversant with its themes and literature just a few years ago after reading The Anatomy of Eve written by Dr. Leopold Stein, a Jungian analyst. In the middle of his study of four cases, he included a most informative chapter on the subject. This served to stimulate me to wider reading in that area. In 1932, at the suggestion of Thomas Burke, the novelist, I submitted my manuscript to one of his publishers, Messrs. Constable in London. They were unable to use it, but made some encouraging comments and advised me to submit it to writers. To my delight and surprise, writers published it, and throughout the years, the reaction it has had indicated other students found it also fulfilled their need for a condensed and simplified survey of such a vast subject as the Kabbalah. The importance of this book to me was and is fivefold. It provided a yardstick by which to measure my personal progress in the understanding of the Kabbalah. Two, therefore it can have an equivalent value of the modern study student. Three, it served as theoretical introduction to the Kabbalistic foundation of the magical work of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. It throws considerable light on the occasionally obscure writings of Aleister Crowley. It is dedicated to Crowley, who has the... who was the... excuse me... Ankh Af Na Kansu, mentioned in the Book of the Law, a dedication which served both as a token of personal loyalty and devotion to Crowley, but was also a gesture of my spiritual independence from him. In his profound investigation into the origins and basic nature of man, Robert Ardre, an African genesis, recently made a shocking statement. Although man has, has begun the conquest of outer space, the ignorance of his own nature, says Ardre, has become institutionalized, universalized, and sanctified. He further states that there that were a brotherhood of man to be formed today, its only possible common bond would be ignorance of what man is. Such a condition is both deplorable and appalling when the means are readily available for man to acquire a thorough understanding of himself and in so doing an understanding of his neighbor and the world in which he lives as well as the greater universe of which is each is a part. May everyone who reads this new edition of A Garden of Pomegranates be encouraged and inspired to light his own candle of, candle of inner vision and begin his journey into the boundless space that lies within himself. Then, through realization of his true identity, each student can become a lamp unto his own path. And more, awareness of the truth of his being will rip asunder the veil of unknowing that has heretofore enshrouded the star he already is, permitting the brilliance of his light to illumine, to illumine the darkness of that part of the universe in which he abides. All right, the preface. Based on the vesicle and the Song of Songs, thy plants are an orchard of pomegranates. A book entitled Pardis Rimmanim came to be written by Rabbi Moses Cordovero in the 16th century. 
By some authorities, this philosopher is considered as the greatest lamp in post zoharic days of the spiritual menorah. The Kabbalah, which, with so rare a grace and so profuse an irradiation of the, the supernal light, illuminated the literature and religious philosophy of the Jewish people as well as their immediate and subsequent neighbors in the diaspora. The English equivalent of Pardis Ramonim, a garden of pomegranates, I have adopted as the title of my own modest work, although I am forced to confess that this latter has but little connection, either in actual fact or in historicity, with that of Cordovero, in the golden harvest of purely spiritual intimations, which the Holy Kabbalah brings, I truly feel that a veritable garden of the soul may be builded. A garden of immense magnitude and lofty significance wherein may be discovered by each one of us all manner and kind of exotic fruit and gracious flower of exquisite color. The pomegranate, may I add, has always been for mystics everywhere a favorable object for recondite symbolism. The garden or orchard has likewise produced in that book named the Book of Splendor, an almost inexhaustible treasury of spiritual imagery of superb and magnificent taste. This book goes forth then in that hope that, as a modern writer has put it, there are not many those who have no secret garden of the mind, for this garden alone can give refreshment when life is barren of peace and sustenance or satisfactory answer. Such sanctuaries may be reached by a certain philosophy or faith, by the guidance of a beloved author, or an understanding friend by a way of the temples of music and art, or by groping after truth through the vast kingdoms of knowledge, they encompass almost always truth and beauty, and are radiant with the light that never was on sea or land. Claire Cameron, Greenfields of England Should there be those who are so unfortunate as to possess no such sacred sanctuary of their own, one builded with their own hands, I humbly offer this well-tended garden of pomegranates which has been bequeathed to me. I hope that therein may be gathered a few little shoots, a rare flower or two, or some ripe fruit, fruit which may serve as the nucleus or the wherewithal for the planting of such a secret garden of the mind, without which there is no peace, nor joy, nor happiness. It is fitting that a note of appreciation to my predecessors in Kabbalistic research should accompany this work, in which I have endeavored to present an exposition of the basic principles underlying the Kabbalah, to serve as a textbook for its study. I have scrupulously avoided contention and unnecessary controversy. I am greatly indebted to Madame H. P. Vlavatsky's writing, and I believe I shall not be too egotistical in claiming that a proper understanding of the principles out line herein will reveal main points of subtlety and philosophic interest in her secret doctrine and aid in the comprehension of this monumental work of hers. The same is also true of S. L. McGregor Mather's translation of portions of the Zohar, the Kabbalah Unveiled, and of Arthur E. Waite's excellent Compendium of the Zohar, the Secret Doctrine in Israel, both of which are closed books in the main to most students of mystical lore, and philosophy who do not have the specialized comparative knowledge which I have endeavored to incorporate in this little book. I should here call attention to a tract, the authors of which is unknown, entitled The 32 Paths of Wisdom, of which splendid translations have been made by W. Wynne Westcott, Arthur E. Waite, and Nut Stenring. In the course of time, this appears to have become incorporated into the and affiliated with the text of the Sefer Yeshira, although several Critics place it at a later date than the genuine Mishnahs of the Sefer Yesirah. However, in giving the titles of the past from this track, I have named throughout the source of the Sefer Yesirah to avoid unnecessary confusion. It is to be hoped that no adverse criticism will arise on this point. Since the question of magic has been slightly dealt with in the last chapter of this book, it is perhaps advisable here to state that the interpretations given to certain doctrines and to some of the Hebrew letters border very closely on magical formula. I have purposely refrained, however, from entering into a deeper consideration of the practical Kabbalah, although several hints of value may be discovered in the explanations of the Tetragrammatron, for example, which may prove of no inconsiderable service. As I have previously remarked, this book is primarily intended as an elementary textbook of the Kabbalah, interpreted as a new system for philosophical clarification, 
This must be constitute my sole excuse for what may appear to be a refusal to deal more adequately adequately with methods of attainment. That's a mouthful, is it not? <laughs> Trust me, it work. The chapter one: Historical Survey: A Garden of Pomegranates. The Kabbalah is a traditional body of wisdom purporting to deal in extenso with the tremendous problems of the origin and nature of life and the evolution of man and the universe. The word Kabbalah is derived from a Hebrew root, meaning to receive. The legend is that this philosophy is a knowledge of things first taught by the Demerugos to a select company of spiritual intelligence of a lofty rank who, after the fall, communicated its divine injunctions to mankind, who in reality were themselves in incarn incarnation. It is also denominated the Chokma Nestora, the secret wisdom, so-called because it has been orally transmitted from adept to pupil in the secret sanctuaries of initiation. Tradition has, its, has it that no one part of this doctrine was accepted as authoritative until it had been subjected to severe and minute criticisms and investigation by methods of practical research to be described later. To come down to more historical ground, the Kabbalah is the Jewish mystical teaching concerning the initiated interpretation of the Hebrew scriptures. It is a system of spiritual philosophy or theosophy using the, the word in its original implications, or eos eolia, which has not only exercised for centuries an influence on the intellectual development of so shrewd and clear thinking of people as the Jews, but has attracted the attention of many renowned theological and philosophical thinkers, particularly in the 16th and 17th centuries. Among those devoted to the study of its theorems were Raymond Lowley, the scholastic metaphys metaphysician and alchemist, John Ruklin, who revived Oriental philosophy in Europe, John Baptist von Helmont, the physician and chemist who discovered hydrogen, Baruch Spinoza, the excommunicated, God-intoxicated Jewish philosopher, and Dr. Henry Moore, the infamous Cambridge Platonist. These men, to name but a few among many who have been attracted to the Kabbalistic ideology after restlessly searching for a world view which should disclose to them the true explanations of life and show the real inner bond uniting all things, found the cravings of their mind at least partially satisfied by its psychological and philosophical systems. It is often assumed today that Judaism and mysticism stand at opposite poles of thought, and that therefore Jewish mysticism is a glaring contradiction in terms. The erroneous assumption here arises from the antithesis of laws and faith. as set up by St. Paul's proselytizing mentality and, in a lesser degree, by the rationalist efforts of Maimonides, Maimonides to square everything with formal Aristotelian principles, falsely stamping Judaism as a religion of unrelieved legalism. Mysticism is the irreconcilable enemy of purely religious legalism. Confusion is also due to the efforts of those theologians in medieval times who, being desirous of saving their benighted Hebrew brethren from the pangs of eternal torture and damnation in the nether regions, muddled and tampered not only with the original text but with extreme sectarian interpretations in order to show that the authors of the Kabbalistic books were desirous that their Jewish posterity should become apostles to Christianity. The Kabbalah taken in its traditional and literal form as contain, contained in the Sefer Yesira, Bes Elohim, Pardis, Roman, Romanim, and Sefer Hazahar is either mostly unintelligible or at first glance apparent nonsense to the ordinary logical person, but it contains as its ground plan the most precious jewel of human thought, that geometrical arrangements of names, numbers, symbols, and ideas called the Tree of Life. It is called most precious because it has been found to be the most convenient system yet discovered of classifying the phenomena of the universe and recording their relations whereof the proof is limitless possibilities for analytic and synthetic thought which follow the adoption of this schema. 
the history of the Kabbalah so far as the publication of early exoteric tests is concerned is indeterminate and vague. Literary criticism traces the Yefer Yetzira, supposedly by Rabbi Akiba, and the Sefer Hazohar by Rabbi Simeon ben Yokai, its main text to about the 8th century. In the first case and the 3rd or 4th century AD in the latter, some historians claim that the Kabbalah is a derivative from Pythagorean, Gnostic, and Neoplatonic sources, this latter view being in particular the opinion of Mr. Christian D. Ginsburg. The great Jewish historian Greats, too, holds the unhistoric view that Jewish mysticism is a morbid late growth, foreign to the religious genius of Israel, and that it has its origin in the speculations of one Isaac the Blind in Spain, somewhere between the 11th and 12th centuries. Greats regarded the Kabbalah, the Zohar, in particular as a false doctrine, which although new, styled itself a genuine teaching of Israel. This statement is altogether without foundation in fact. For a careful perusal of the books of the Old Testament, the Talmud and other well-known rabbinical records which have come down to us indicate that there the early monumental basis of the Kabbalah may be found. The Kabbalistic doctrine admittedly is not explicit there, but analyzes, rev, analysts reveal it is to be ta- Tacitically assumed, and the many cryptic remarks of several of the more important rabbis can have no particle of meaning without the implication of a mystical philosophy cherished and venerated in their hearts and affecting the whole of their teachings. In his brilliant essay, The Origin of Letters and Numbers According to Yefer Yitzira, Mr. Phineas Mordell argues that the Pythagorean number philosophy, the greatest enigma of all philosophical systems of antiquity, is identical with that of Yefer Yetzira and that its philosophical apparently emanated that its philosophy apparently emanated from one of the Hebrew prophetic schools. Mordell finally hazards the opinion that the Yefer, the Sefer Yetzirah, represents the genuine fragments of Philolus, who was the first to publish the Pythagorean philosophy, and that Philolus seems to correspond in very curious ways to Joseph ben Uziel, who wrote down the Sefer Yezira. If the latter theory can be maintained, then we may claim for the Sefer Yezira a pre-Talmudic origin, probably the second century prior to the Christian era. The Zora, if actually the work of Simeon ben Yakai, was never consigned to writing at the time, but had been orally handed down by the companions of the Holy Assemblies, being finally written up by the Rabbi Moses ben Leon in the 13th century. Madame Blavatsky ventures the hypothesis that the Zohar, as now possessed by us, was arranged and re-edited by Moses de Leon after having been tampered with to a considerable extent by Jewish rabbis and Christian ecclesiastics prior to the 13th century. Ginsburg in his Kabbalah gives several reasons why the Zohar must have been written in the 13th century. He, his arguments, though interesting in numerous ways, do not take the consideration in fact that there has always been an oral tradition. Isaac Meyer, in his large and in a number of ways authoritative tome entitled The Kabbalah, analyzes very carefully those objections advanced by Ginsburg and others, and I am bound to confess that his answers add Saratim confute this theory of the 13th century origin of the Zohar. Dr. S. M. Slerzinesi, one-time reader in rabbinic and Talmudic literature at Cambridge, says the nucleus of this book is of Mishnic times. Rabbi Shimeon ben Yakai was the author of the Zohar, in the same sense that Rabbi Yohanan was the author of the Palestinian Talmud. I he he gave the first impulse to the composition of the book, and I find that Mr. Arthur Edward Waite, in his scholarly and classic work, The Holy Kabbalah, wherein he examines most of the arguments concerning the origins of the origin and history of this book of splendor, inclines 
to the view here and before set forth, steering a middle course, believing that while much of it does pertain to the era of Ben Leon, nevertheless, a great deal more bears inevitably the stamp of antiquity. It most certainly is not altogether improbable that the Zohar, with its mystical doctrines comparable, nay, identical in most each of its details with those of other races and other climes, should have been composed originally by Simeon ben Yakai or another of his close associates or students in the 2nd century, but not committed to writing by Moses de Leon until the 13th century. A very similar presentation of the above hypothesis is found in Professor Al Belson's excellent work entitled Jewish Mysticism, wherein we read that we must be on our guard against following the mistaken opinion of a certain set of Jewish theologians who would have us regard the whole of the medieval Kabbalah, of which the Zohar is a conspicuous and representative part, as a sudden and strange importation f from without. It is really a continuation of the old stream of Talmudic and Madrashic thought, with the admixture of extraneous elements picked up, as was inevitable by the stream's course through many lands, elements the commingling of which must have in many ways transformed the original color and nature of the stream. By that, as it may, and ignoring the sterile aspects of controversy, the public appearance of the Zohar was the great landmark in the development of the Kabbalah, and we today are able to divide its history into two main periods, pre- and post-Saharic. While it is undeniable that there were Jewish prophetic and mystical schools of great proficiency in possessing much recondite knowledge in biblical times, such as that of Samuel, the Essenes, and Philo, yet the first Kabbalistic schools of which we have any accurate public record was known as the School of Genorona in Spain, the 12th century AD, so called because its founder Isaac the Blind and many of his disciples were, were born there, of the founder of the school, practically nothing is known. Two of his students were Rabbi Azriel and Rabbi Ezra, the former was the author of a classic philosophical work entitled The Commentary on the Ten Sephiroth, an excellent and most lucid exposition of the Kabbalistic philosophy and considered an authoritative work by those who know it. These were succeeded by Nachmanides, born in 1195 after death, or A.D., Acerdominus, or whatever you want to call it. i got to go down two pages. Do, wait, is it three pages? Holy crap. Oh, man, where did it go? Oh no. This thing is all over the place. Okay. Yep. Okay, got it. who was the real cause of the attention devoted to this esoteric system in those days in Spain and Europe generally. His works deal mainly with the three methods Deal mainly with the three methods of permutation of numbers, letters, and words to be described in chapter VI. The philosophy underwent a further elaboration and exposition in the hands of our Isaac Nasir and Jacob ben Shishet in the 12th century, the latter composing a, a treatise in rhyme prose and a series of eight essays dealing with doctrines in the of the infinite and soft reincarnation, Gilgalim, the doctrine of divine retribution, Sad Hagimal, or to use a more preferable oriental term, karma, and a peculiar type of Christology. Next in succession with the school of Segovia and its disciples, among whom was one Toldras Abu Lafia, a physician and financier occupying an important and most distinguished position in the court of Sancho the IV, king of Castile, the characteristic predisposition of this school was its devotion to exe exegetical methods, its discipline. Plin, this is, this, excuse me, its disciples endeavoring to interpret the Bible and the Haggadah in accordance with the doctrinal Kabbal. Kabbalah. Excuse me. A contemporary school believed that Judaism of that day, taken from an exclusive, exclusively philosophical standpoint, did not show the right way to sanctuary, and endeavored to combine philosophy and Kabbalah, illustrating their various theorems by mathematical forms. About 1240 A.D. was born Abraham. Abu Lafia, who became a celebrated figure, bringing, however, a great deal of disrepute to the name of 
this theosophy, he studied philosophy, medicine, and philosophy, as well as those few books on the Kabbalah which were available at the time. He soon perceived that the Pythagorean number philosophy was identical with the expounded in the the Sefer Yestira, and later becoming dissatisfied with academic research, he turned towards that aspect of Kabbalah termed, I can't speak Hebrew to that, to that great of an extent, or the practical Kabbalah, which today we term magic. Unfortunately, the Kabbalistic in the... Unfortunately, the Kabbalists in the public eye at that time were not acquainted with the developed specialized technique that is now available, derived as it is from the Kalajai and Spiritum Sanctum. The result was that Abulafai, Abulafia became quite deluded in his subsequent experimentations and journey to Rome to endeavor to convert the Pope, of all people, to, to Judaism. How successful were his efforts? Can be left to the reader to judge. I know how successful they are. What's up today, 2024, bitches? Who is the who was Prince William? What is Prince William wearing on his head? Later, we held himself in a most enthusiastic way as the long-expected Messiah and prophesy the millennium, which fell to occur. In his, <laughs> I love this. I'm, you guys don't even understand. In like his influence on the whole has been a deleterious one. A disciple of his, Joseph Gikatila, wrote in the interest and defense of his teacher a number of treatises, treatises dealing with the several aspects of exegesis established by him. The Zohar is the next major development. This book combines absorbing and synthesizing the different features and doctrines of the previous schools made its debut creating a profound sensation in the theological and philosophical circles by reason of its speculations concerning God, the doctrine of emanations, the evolution of the universe, the soul, and its transmigrations, and its final return to the source of all, the new era in the history of the Kabbalah created by the appearance of the storehouse of legend, philosophy, and anecdote, has continued right down to this present day. Yet nearly every writer who has since espoused the doctrines of the Kabbalah has made the Zohar his principal textbook and its exponents have applied themselves assiduously to commentaries, ep 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 epitomies, and translations, missing, however, with only a few exceptions, the real underlying possibilities of the Kabbalistic tree of life. The Zohar so impressed the celebrated scholastic metaphysician and experimental chemist Raymond Lowley that it suggested to him the development of Ars Magna, the great work and idea in the exposition of which he exhibits the loftiest conceptions of the Kabbalah regarding it as a divine science and a genuine revelation of light to the human soul. He was one of those few isolated figures attracted to a study who saw through its use of a peculiar type of symbol and endeavored to construct a workable magical or philosophical alphabet, an explanation of which will be attempted in the remaining chapters of this work. Abraham Ibn Wakar uh, Pico de Marandola, Ruklin Moses Cordovero, and Isaac Luria are a few of the more important thinkers before the 17th century whose speculations have affected in various ways the progress of Kabbalistic, Kabbalistic research. The first named an Aristotelian made a really noble attempt to reconcile Kabbalah with the academic philosophy of his day and wrote a treatise which is an excellent companion of the Kabbalah. Mirandola and Reeklin were Christians who took up a study of the Kabbalah with the ulterior motive of obtaining a suitable weapon wherewith to convert Jews to Christianity. Some Jews were so misguided and sadly bewildered by the mingling of texts and distorted interpretations which ensued that they actually forsook Judaism. Paul Ricci, physician to the Emperor Maximilian I, John Stephen Riddingal, a translator of the Sefer Yesera into Latin, and in more recent times, Jacob Frank and his community were won over to Christianity by the controversial claims that the Zohar both concealed and revealed the doctrines of the Nazarene. Such proofs naturally brought only only contempt to their authors and today argue badly against both the ad adducers and to the scepters of them. Cordova became a master of the Kabbalah at an early age and his principal works were are philosophical having a little having little to do with the magical or practical sign. Luria founded a school the precise opposite to that of 
Cordovero. He himself was a, ze was a zealous and brilliant student, both of the Talmud and rabbinic lore, but found that the simple retirement of a life of study did not satisfy him. He thereupon retired to the banks of the Nile, where he gave himself over exclusively to meditation and ascetic practices. Receiving visions of an amazing character, he wrote a book outlining his conceptions of the theory of reincarnation, entitled Ha Gilgolim. A pupil of his, rab uh, of his rabbi Chaim Vital produced a large work, The Tree of Life, based on the oral teachings of the Master, thereby giving a tremendous impetus to Kabbalistic study and practice. There are several Kabbalists of varying degrees of importance in the intervening period of the post-Saharic history. Russia, Poland, and Lithuania gave refuge to a number of them. None of these have profoundly publicly, none of these have expounded publicly that particular portion of the philosophy to which this present treatise is devoted. The spiritual revivalist movement inaugurated amongst the Jews of Poland by Rabbi Israel Baum Sham Tov is the f in the first half of the 18th century is sufficiently important to warrant some mention here. For although Chassidism, Chassidism at that as that movement was called, derives in its enthusiasm from contact with nature and the great outdoors of the Carpathians. It has its primary literary origin and significant inspirations in the books which constitutes the Kabbalah. Chassidism gave the doctrines of the Zohar to the Am Ha Eretz in a way in which no previous set of rabbis has succeeded in doing, and it would, moreover, appear that the practical Kabbalah received a considerable impetus at that at the same time, for we find that Poland, Galicia, and certain portions of Russia have been the scene of the activities of wandering rabbis and Talmudic so scholars who were styled Tzadikim, or magicians, men who assiduously devoted their lives and their powers to the practical Kabbalah. But it was not until the last century, with its impetus to all, impetus to all kinds of studies in comparative mythology and religious controversy, that we discover an attempt to wield all philosophies, religions, scientific ideas, and symbols into a co coherent whole. Eliphaz Levi Zahed, a Roman Catholic deacon of remarkable perspicuity, in 1852 published a brilliant volume, *The Doctrine in Ritual de La Huate Magi, in which we find clear and unmistakable symptoms of an understanding of the underlying basis of the Kabbalah in ten sephiros and the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet as a suitable framework for the construction of a workable system for philosophical comparisons and synthesis. It is said that he published this work at a time when information on all occult matters was strictly prohibited for various reasons of its own by the esoteric school to which he belonged. We find then a companion volume issued but a short while after La Historie de la Magie. Wherein undoubt undoubtedly to protect himself from the censure leveled at him and throw unsuspecting inquirers off the track, he contradicts his former conclusions and theorizations. Several devoted expositors of impeccable scholarship in the last half of the 19th century were responsible for the modern regeneration of the fundamental and sancra principles of the Kabbalah, devoid of the theological assert accretions and hysterical superstitions which were deposited on this venerable arcane philosophy during the Middle Ages. W. Wynne Westcott, who translated the Sefer Yesirah into English and wrote An Introduction to the Study of the Kabbalah, S. L. McGregor Mathers, the translator of portions of the Zohar and the Sacred Magic of Aberlin and the Mage, Madame Blavatsky, the, that lion-hearted woman who brought Eastern esoteric philosophy to the attention of Western students, Arthur Edward Waite, who made available expository summaries of various of the Kabbalistic works, and the poet Aleister Crowley, to whose Lieber 777 and Sefer Sefiroth, among many other fine philosophic writings, I am in no little degree indebted. 
All these have provided a wealth of vital information which could be utilized for the re for the construction of a philosophical alphabet. Literally, this is just a historical survey of what led up to how he what he needed to learn and, and study and become aware of just to be able to write this book. That's how much work goes into just writing a book when you be, study and you write books at the 13th dimensional level. Chapter 2, The Pit. The philosophy of the Kabbalah is essentially esoteric, yet the practical methods of esoteric and secular investigations are essentially identical. Continual and persistent experimentation, the endeavor to eliminate chance and error, and the effort to ascertain the constants and variables of the equations investigated. The one main difference is that they occupy themselves exclusively with different realms of research. Formal academic philosophy glor glorifies the intellect, and thus makes research into what are, after all, incidents incidentals if we consider philosophy as the supreme means of investigating the problems of life in the universe the kabbalah makes the primary claim that the intellect contains wherein itself a principle of self-contradiction and that therefore it is an unreliable instrument to use in the great quest for truth numerous academic philosophers have likewise arrived at a similar conclusion some of the greater of these have de despaired of ever devising a suitable method of transcending the limitation and becoming and became skeptics. Others, seeing simply the solution, have seized upon intuition, or to be more accurate, the intellectual concept of intuition, leaving us, however, with no method, methods of checking and verifying that intuition, which in consequence is so liable to generate into mere guesswork, colored by personal inclination and abetted by gross wish fantasism or phantasm. The two main methods of the traditional and esoteric Kabbalah are meditation yoga and practical Kabbalah magic. By yoga is meant that rigorous system of mental and self-discipline which, as its primary aim, the absolute and complete control of the thinking pr principle, the rock, the ultimate object being to obtain the faculty with which to still the stream of thought at will. That which is behind, as it were, or above, or beyond the mind can manifest on to the stillness thus produced. The quiescence of the mental turbulence is the primary essential. With the faculty at command, with this faculty at command, the student is taught to exalt the mind by various technical methods of magic until it overrides the normal limitations and barriers of its nature ascending in a tremendous, unquenchable column of fire-like ecstasy to the universal consciousness with which it becomes united. Once having become at one with transcendental existence, it intuitively partakes of universal knowledge, which is considered to be a more reliable source of information than the rational introspection of the intellect or the experimental scientific investigation of matter can give. It is the tapping of the source of life itself, the fons et origo of existence rather than a blind groping in the dark after confused symbols which alone appear on the so-called practical or rational plane of thought. Secular science, or positivism, has busied itself with the investigation of matter and the visible universe as perceived through the five senses. It affirms that by a study of phenomena, we are able to approach to the world as it really is, to the things in themselves. It is that system which affirms that apprehension is only a name for a certain series of biological and chemical changes occurring in certain of the contents of our material skulls, and that by an investigation of these of things as they appear to be, we can come to an understanding of their causes, what they really are. The contrary philosophical arguments of the idealistic schools is that in studying the laws of nature, we only study the laws of our own mind, our minds. That is, that it would be quite simple to demonstrate that after all, we really attach very little meaning to such ideas as matter, motion and weight, etc., other than a purely idealistic one, that they are mere phases of our thought. Kabbalist and all the various schools of mystics generally begin from a still more absolute, absolute point of view, arguing that the whole controversy is purely a verbal one, 
for all such ontological propositions can, with a little ingenuity, be reduced to one form or another. There is, in consequence of this observation, in the realm of modern philosophy, what is frankly considered to be an uncompromising deadlock. Kabbalists assert that reason is a weapon inadequate to the search for reality, since its nature is essentially self-contradictory. Hume and Kant both saw this, but the one became a, ske a skeptic in the wildest sense of the term, and with the other, the conclusion hid itself behind a verbose transcendentalism. Spencer too saw it, but tried to gloss it over and to bury it beneath the ponder ponderousness of his erudition. The Kabbalah, in the words of one of its most zealous advocates, settles the dispute of by laying a finger on the weak point. Also, reason is a lie, for there is a factor infinite and unknown, and all their words are skew-wise. The universe cannot be explained by reason. Its nature is obviously irrational. As remarked by Professor Henry Bergson, our thought in its purely logical form is incapable of presenting the true nature of life, and the intellectual faculty is characterized by a natural inability to comprehend life. Professor Arthur S. Ignaton Professor Arthur S. Ignaton has also observed that the ultimate element of the theory of the world must be of a nature impossible to define in terms recognizable to the mind. A more recent statement by one who is considered an excellent exponent of modern scientific opinion is found in What I Dare and What Dare I Think by Julian Huxley. There is no reason why the universe is perfect. There is indeed no reason why it should be rational. One of the paradoxes of the intellect is that despite the fact that our knowledge is purely phenomenal, nevertheless, even that knowledge is of no real depth. For instance, the judgment for instance, the judgment A is A is a meaningless tautology. In order to be significant, our thought must pass beyond the bare identity of an object with itself. But it must not pass to something which has not in common with that object. Thus if if we assert A equals B, the judgment is false. Since we pass from A to B, the latter having nothing in common with A. It is obvious, however, that a definition of this unknown A can only be achieved by saying either A equals B or A equals C D. In the first case, the idea of B is really implicit in A. Thus we have learned nothing. And if not so, the statement is false. One simply defines one unknown term of another and nothing is gained. In the second case, C and D themselves require definition as E, F, and G, H respectively. The process becomes ex extended, but it is bound to end by the eventual exhaustion of the alphabet, Y equals Z, A. In short, one gets no further than A equals A. The relation of this whole series of equations then becomes apparent, and the conclusion to which one is forced is that each and every term is a thing in itself, unknown, though to some extent apprehensible by intuition. There are several proofs of this, the simplest of which is perhaps as follows, showing that the most obvious statement cannot bear analysis. A simple question is, what is vermilion? That vermilion is red is undeniable, no doubt, but quite meaningless nevertheless, for each of the two terms must be defined by means of at least two others of which the same is true. So simple an inquiry to as why is sugar sweet involves a vast multitude of very highly complicated chemical researches, each one of which eventually leads to that blindest of all blank walls, what is matter, what the perceiving mind. We may continue further if we wish and ask what is the moon. Science let, let us facetiously suppose reply, replies green cheese. For our one moon, we now have two distinct ideas, and all the simplicity vanish and recedes in the darkness. Greenness and cheese. 
The one depends on the light of the sun, the sense apparatus of the optic nerves and the organs, and a thousand of other things, the latter on bacteria fermentation and the nature of the cow. Then we continue to split hairs and juggle words, not but hairs and words and juggling and splitting, and we have got no single question answered in any ultimate sense at all. There is therefore no possible escape from this bottomless pit of confusion, save by the development of a faculty of mind which shall not be manifestly inadequate in any of these ways. We must employ means other than and superior to ratiocination. Ratio ratio we thus approach the problem of the development of the nest. Shama or intuition, intuition. We thus approach the problem of the development of intuition, and it is here that the Kabbalah differs in method and content from secular science and academic philosophy. Yet the progress of secular science in the last thirty years certainly brings it nearer to the Kabbalistic conception of things. The old sanctions of a scientific mechanism have nearly all disappeared, and the terms which appeared to the Victorians so simple, objective, and intelligible such as matter, energy, space, etc. have completely failed to resist analysis. A few modern thinkers seeing clearly the absolute debacle in which the old positivist science was bound to lead them, the breaking up of this icy expanse of frozen thought, de determined it at all costs to find a modus vivendi for Athena, this necessity was emphasized in the most surprising way by the result of the Mitchelson-Morley experiments when physics itself calmly and frankly offered a contradiction in terms. It was not the metaphysicians, this time, who were picking holes in, the, in a vacuum. It was the mathematicians and the physicists who found the ground completely cut away from under their feet. It was not enough to replace the geometry of the Eusalid by those of Ryman and Lobtovetsky and the mechanics of Newton by those of Einstein so long as any of these axioms of the old thought and the definition of its terms survived, they deliberately abandoned positivism and materialism for an indeterminate mysticism, creating a new mathematical philosophy and a new logic where an infinite or rather transfinite, transfinite idea might be made commensurable with those of ordinary thought and the forlorn hope that all might live happily ever after. In short, to use a Kabbalistic nomenclature, they found it incumbent upon themselves to adopt for inclusion of terms of rock or intellect concepts which are proper only to nashmaka or the organ and faculty of direct spiritual ap perception and intuition. This same process took place in philosophy years earlier. Had the dialectic of Hegel been only half understood, the major portion of philosophical speculations from the schoolmen to Kant's perception of the antonymes of reason would have been thrown overboard. C.G. Jung, the eminent European psychoanalysis, writes in Wilhelm, Secret of the Golden Flower, therefore I can only take the reaction which begins in the West against the intellect, in favor of intellect, intuition as a mark of cultural advance, a widening of consciousness beyond the two narrow limits set by a tyrannical intellect. Incidentally, one of the greatest difficulties experienced by the philosopher, a difficulty almost insurmountable by the student, one which continually tends to increase rather diminish with the advance in knowledge, is this. It is practically impossible to gain any clear intellectual comprehension of the meaning of philosophical terms employed. Every thinker has his own private conception of and meaning for every such common and universally used terms as as soul and mind, and in the vast majority of cases, he does not so much as suspect that other writers may employ the same term under a different connotation. Even technical writers, those who sometimes take the trouble of defining their terms before using them, are too often at variance with one another. The diversity is very great, as stated above in the case of the word soul. We find one writer 
predicating of the soul that it is A, B, and C, while his fellow students protest vehemently that it is nothing of the sort but G, E, and F. However, let it us suppose for a moment that by some miracle we obtain a clear idea of the meaning of the word. The trouble has merely begun, for there immediately arises the question of the relation of one term to the others. In view of this continual source of misunderstanding, it is clearly necessary to establish a fundamental and universal language for the communication of ideas. Once one understands with bitter approval the sad outbursts of the aged fiat. If I had my life to live over again, the first thing I would do would be to invent an entirely new system of symbols whereby to convey my ideas. As a matter of fact, had he put, had he but known this, certain people, principally some of the early Kabbalists, among whom we may include Raymond Lowley, William Postel etc. had actually attempted this great work of constructing a coherent system. Those which were coherent were, sad to say, hardly comprehended or subscribed to. It is sometimes claimed that the Buddhist terminology as contained in the Abhidhamma provides a sufficiently complete philosophical alphabet. While there is much to be said in favor of the Buddhist system, we cannot wholly concur with this opinion for the following reasons. Firstly, the actual words are barbarously long, impossibly so for the average European. Secondly, an understanding of that system demands complete acquiescence in the Buddhist doctrinalia, which we are not prepared to give. Thirdly, the meaning of the terms is not as clear, precise, and comprehensive as could be wished. There is most certainly a great deal of pedantry, disputed matter, and confusion. Only recently I learned that Miss Rise Davids had issued a book on Buddhist origins in which the question, among others, is raised by her as to the correct translation or meaning. Or meaning of the Pali word Dhamma, whether it implies law, conscience, life, or simply the Buddhist doctrine. Fourthly, the terminology is exclusively psychological and takes no account of extra Buddhistic ideas, and it bears but little relation to the general order of the universe. It might, of course, be supplemented by Hindu or other terminology, but to do so would immediately introduce more numerous elements of controversy. We should at once be lost in endless discussion as to whether nibbana was nirvana and as to whether extinction or something else was implied and so on forever the system of the kabbalah whose terms as we shall see are largely symbolic is of course superficially open to this last objection but because it is largely very largely symbolic it has the best sanction of those who are considered m in it, authorities and the sciences, for the whole of modern science occupies itself with various symbols by which it endeavors to comprehend the physical world, symbols beyond which, however, it frankly confesses itself unable to pass. An illuminating remark occurs in Professor Ennington's 1928 Swarthmore Lecture, Science and the Unseen World. I can only say that physical science has turned its back on all such models regarding them now rather as a hindrance to the apprehension of the tr truth behind phenomena. And if today you ask a physicist who has finally made out the if you ask a physicist what he has finally made out the aether or the electron to be, the answer will not be a description in terms of billiards, balls, or flying wheels, or anything concrete. He will point instead to a number of symbols and a set of mathematical equations which they satisfy. What do the symbols stand for? The mysterious reply is given that physics is indifferent to that. It has no means of probing beneath the symbolism. To understand the phenomena of the physical world, it is necessary to know the equations which the symbols obey, but not the nature of which is being symbolized. Sir James James confirms his this view of the use of symbols, for on page 141 of his The Mysterious Universe, he writes, The making of models or pictures to explain mathematical formulae and the phenomena they describe is not a step towards, but a step away from reality. In brief, a mathematical formula can never tell us what a thing is, but only how it behaves. It can only specify an object through its properties. 
The Kabbalists, therefore, is in no fear of attack from holistic sources because of his use of symbols. For the real basis of the Holy Kabbalah, the ten sephiros and the twenty-two paths is mathematically sound and definite. We can easily discard the theological and dogmatic interpretations of the ancient Rabbanim as useless and not affecting this real basis itself and refer everything in the universe to the fundamental systems of pure number. Its symbols will be intelligible to all rational minds in identical sense since the relation obtaining between these symbols are fixed by nature. It is this consideration which has led to the adoption of the Kabbalistic tree of life as the basis of the universal philosophical alphabet. The apologia for this system, if such be needed, is, as has already been stated, that our purest conceptions are symbolized in mathematics. Bertrand Russell, Cantor Poincaré, Einstein, and others have been hard at work to replace the Victorian empiricism by an intelligible, coherent interpretation of the universe by means of mathematical ideas and symbols. Modern conceptions of mathematics, chem chemistry, and physics are sheer paradox to the plain man who thinks of matter, for example, as something that he can knock up against. There appears to be no doubt nowadays that the climate nature of sciences in any of its branches will be purely abstract, almost of a Kabbalistic character, one might say, even though it may never be officially denominated the Kabbalah. It is natural and proper to represent the cosmos or any part of it or its operation in any of its aspects by the symbols of pure number. The ten numbers and the twenty-two letters of the Hebrew alphabet with their traditional and rational correspondences also taking into consideration their numerical and geometrical relations afford us a coherent systematic groundwork for our alphabet, a basis sufficiently rigid for our foundation, yet sufficiently elastic for our superstructure. In the previous chapter, it was suggested, excuse me, chapter 3, the Sephiros. In the previous chapter, it was suggested that the Kabbalah is the most suitable system for the basis of our magical alphabet, to which we shall be able to refer the sum total all of all our knowledge and experience religious, philosophical, and scientific. The Kabbalistic alphabet is, as we shall proceed to explain, an elaborate system of attributions and correspondences, a convenient method of classification enabling the philosopher to docket his experiences and ideas as he obtains them. It is comparable to a filing cabinet of 32 jackets in which an extensive system of information is filed. It should be fallacious for the student to expect a concrete definition of everything which the cabinet contains. That is a sheer impossibility of quite obvious re for quite obvious reasons. Each student must, for must work for himself once given the method of putting the whole of his mental and moral constitution into these 32 filing jackets, the necessities the necessity for personal work becomes apparent when one realizes that in normal business procedure, for instance, one would not purchase a filing cabinet with the names of all past, present, and future correspondents already indexed. It becomes quite evident that the Kabbalistic cabinet, R32 paths, has a system of letters and numbers meaningless in themselves, but as the files are completed, ready to take on a meaning different for each student, as experience increased each letter and number would receive fresh accessions of meaning and significance and by adopting this orderly arrangement we would be enabled to grasp our inner life much more comprehensively than might otherwise be the case the object of the theoretic the objects the object of the theoretical as separate from the practical kabbalah insofar as this thesis is concerned is to enable the student to do three main things first to analyze every idea in terms of the tree of life. Second, to trace a necessary connection and relation to, between every and any class of ideas by referring them to this standard of comparison. Third, to translate any unknown system of symbolism into terms of any known one by its means. To restate the above in a different way, the art of using our filing cabinet arrangement brings home to us the common nature of certain things, the essential differences between others, and the inevitable connection of all things. Moreover, that this is extremely important by the acquisition of an understanding of any one system of mystical philosophies or religion. 
one automatically acquires when relating the comprehension of the tree of life and understanding of every system, so that ultimately by, a spe by species of association of impersonal and abstract ideas, one gradually equilibrizes, equilibrizes the whole of one's mental structure and obtains a simple view of the incalculably vast complexities of the universe, for it is written, equilibrium is the basis of the work. Balance is the basis of the work. I am, a, I am the highest level of Jewish teacher you can you can obtain i'm not being rude just listen to how i share the knowledge i'm presenting now and my mind is is on altered an altered altered state uh, states right now so enjoy serious students will need to make a careful study of the attributions detailed in this work and commit them to memory when by persistent application to his own mental apparatus the numerical systems which with its corresponding with with its correspondences is partially understood is partly understood as opposed to being merely memorized the student will be amazed to find fresh light breaking in on him at every turn as he continues to refer every item in experience and consciousness to this standard one kabbalist of recent years mr charles s jones factor arcad pseudo uh, factor arcad acad is his pseudo name writes as follows in his QBL, it is of primary importance that the details of the plan be memorized. This is possibly the chief reason why in the early times of the Kabbalah was transmitted from mouth to ear and not in writing, for it only bears fruit insofar as it is first rooted in our minds. We may read of it, study it, to some extent, juggle with it on paper and so on, but not until the mind itself takes on the image of the tree and we are able to go mentally from branch to branch, correspondence to correspondence, visualizing the process. And thus making it a living tree do we find that the light of truth dawns upon us and we have as it were succeeded in putting forth a shoot above the earth thus as in the case of a young tree finding ourselves in a new world while yet our roots are firmly implanted in our natural element the Zohar itself speaks of a divine spiritual influence called Mezla, which descends from Kisar to Malchus by way of the past, vivifying and sustaining all things, by en endeavoring to implant the roots of this living tree in our own consciousness, tending it daily with devotion, tenderness, and perseverance, almost imperceptibly, we shall find new spiritual knowledge springing up spontaneously within us. The universe will then begin to appear as a synthetic homogeneous whole and the student will discover that the sum total of his knowledge will become unified and find himself able to transmute even on the intellectual plane the many into the one. This is in the long run discarding all the inessentials the goal of every mystic no matter by which of the names he denominates his path and which of the various by roads he follows. Uh, one other preliminary matter must be touched upon before actually attempting an exegesis of the Sephiros. I heard that many Kabbalists have referred to the Tree of Life, the 78 tarot cards, which are a series of pictorial representations of the universe. Eliphaz Levi writes in La Historia de la Magi as follows, The absolute hieroglyphical science had for its basis an alphabet of which all the gods were letters, and all the letters ideas, all the ideas numbers, and all the numbers perfect signs. This hieroglyphical alphabet of which Moses made the great secret of his Kabbalah in the famous book of Thoth. The leaves of this famous book are also called the Addis of Thoth, the later being the Egyptian god of wisdom, Court de Sebelion, Paris 1781 remarks, were we to hear 
that there exists in our day a work of the ancient Egyptians, one of their books which had escaped the flames which devoured their superb libraries and which contains their purest doctrines, were we to add that this book for several were we to add that this book for several centuries had been accessible to everyone, would it not be surprising, and would that not surprise be at its height were it asserted that people have never suspected it was Egyptian, that they possess it in such a manner that they can hardly be said to possess it at all, that no one has ever attempted to decipher a single leaf, that the outcome of a, re a recondite wisdom is regarded as a mass of ex extravagant design, which means nothing in themselves. Yet this is a true fact. In one word, the book is the pack of tarot cards. The legend as to the origin of these 78 Addis is a most curious and interesting one indeed, although one cannot vouch for its accuracy. It goes at the adepts of antiquity seeing that a cycle of spiritual degradation and mental stagnation was about to descend upon Europe with the advent of what is called the Christian era were preoccupied with the making of plans for the preservation of their accumulated knowledge. It would be held in reserve for the age when men would be sufficiently advanced and spiritually unbiased to receive it, and yet available during the intervening period, even during the cycle of complete intellectual slothfulness, so that any member of the community who felt the inner urge to engage in the studies with which the Kabbalah in particular deals with would obtain easy access to it. In conference assembled within the sanctuary of the Gnosis, they began considering the subject in all its aspects. One adept had furthered the idea of reducing all their knowledge to a few symbols and glyphs, and hewing these into imperishable rocks as was done by King Asoka in India. Others were for the writing of their knowledge as it stood and storing the manuscripts in vast subterranean libraries such as the Blavatsky narrates exist today in Tibet to be open at a much later date. None of these, however, satisfy the majority as fulfilling the required condition until one adept who had hitherto sat reclining, taking but little part in the discussion, spoke somewhat as follows. There is a much more practical yet subtle method. Let us reduce all our knowledge of man and the universe to symbols which can be portrayed in pictures suitable for use as an ordinary game. In such a manner, the accumulated wisdom of the ages will be preserved in an unorthodox way, passing unnoticed by the herd as being the philosophy of the initiates and yet throwing more than a hint to one in search of the truth. Just as the Illuminati card deck does today and will do tomorrow, has the tarot deck done in times of antiquity. That is, that is William Douglas. Their suggestion, admirable in every way, was agreed upon by the assembly and one of their number, an adept skilled in the work of brush, ink and pen, painted a set of 78 hieroglyphs, each representing symbolically some particular aspect of life, man, and the cosmos. And so these cards have come down to us today intact and practically unspoiled. It is true that some artists, neither skilled in the intricacies, intric intricacies I'm sorry, of the Holy Kabbalah, nor adepts as were the originators of the cards in painting copy sets of the Terra. Cards have woefully misinterpreted, misplaced, and in some cases entirely omitted some of the symbols existing on the original set of pictures, yet anyone with a knowledge of the arcane wisdom can reconstruct them with case. It was only in the last century that we had the statement of Eliphas a, a Levi that were a man incarcerated in a dungeon cell in solitary confinement without books or instructions of any kind, it would still be possible for him to obtain from this set of cards an encyclopedic knowledge of the essence of all sciences, religion, and philosophies. Ignoring the specimen of typical Levi verbosity, it is only necessary to point out that instead of using the 10 digits and the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet for the basis of his magical alphabet, Levi adopted as, a, as his fundamental framework the 22 trump cards of the Book of Thoth, attributing to them his knowledge and experience in a way similar to the attribution of the 32 paths of wisdom. 
Some critics have ventured the opinion that the interpretation of the Tree of Life suggests Heron its utilization as a mode of classification does not ring true and that it has no authority in the standard works of the Kabbalah. This criticism is utterly without foundation. In fact, an attempt in this direction is most evident in the Sefer Yetzirah and the Sefer Hasoharar is repeat with the most reconcilite attributions, many of which I have not reproduced here at all for the sake of maintaining simplicity. I can only recommend that those who bring forward these and similar objections should carefully refer to Mr. Waite's epitome of Zoharic philosophy, the secret doctrine in Israel, which substantially demonstrates that the basis of my interpretation has the sanction of the highest Kabbalistic authority. Let us now approach the exegesis of the philosophy of the Kabbalah in its various aspects. First, we shall deal more fully with the ten Sephirothal ideas, giving the student in a later chapter examples of the mode of treatment, which he himself will then be able to follow in studying the attributions of all the paths. O. A. I. N. The universe, as the sum total of all things and living creatures, is conceived as having its primeval origin in infinite space. Nothing or para Brahman, the causeless cause of all manifestations, to quote the Zohar. Before having created any shape in the world, before having produced any form, he was alone, without form, resembling nothing. Who could comprehend him? As he then was before creation since he had no form. The AIN is not a being, it is a no thing. That which is incomprehensible, unknown, and unknowable does not exist, at least to be more accurate, accurate insofar as our own consciousness is concerned. Blavatsky defines this primal reality as, a, as an omnipresent, eternal, and boundless principle on which all speculation is utterly impossible since it so transcends the power of human conception and thus that it would only be dwarfed, dwarfed by any similitude that which is known and named is known and named not from a knowledge of its substance, substance but from its limitations. In itself it is unknowable, unthinkable, and uns. And unspeakable, Rabbi Azrael ben Menahem, born in 1160 AD, a disciple already mentioned of Isaac the Blind, states that the Ain can neither be comprehended by the intellect nor described in words, for there is no letter or word to grasp it, the AIN, and our AI, you understand what I'm saying? In other words, important system. The idea is very picturesquely and graphically represented as the goddess Nuit the queen of absolute space and the naked brilliance of the night sky bluk, the woman jetting forth the milk of the stars, cosmic dust from her paps. Mm, love it. Beautiful wording. It is the absolute or the unknowable or the agnosticism of the Herbert Spencer, the thrice great darkness of the Egyptian sacerdotal caste, and the Chinese Tao, which resembleth the emptiness of space, and which hath no father, it is beyond all other conceptions, higher than the highest. In one of the meditations of the Chang Zhu, we find that Tao cannot be existent. If it were existent, it could not be non-existent. Tao is something beyond material existence. It cannot be conveyed, either by words or by silence, in that state which neither speech which is neither speech nor science, it is transcendental na na nature, may be apprehended to this Kabbalistic conception or principle of zero, would be allocated. Baruch Spinoza's definition of God or substance, that which requires for its conception the conception of no, no other thing. Another of the many symbols used by the Hindus to represent the zero was that of the serpent Ananta, which enclosed the universe, its tail being swallowed in its mouth, represented the retrant nature of the infinity. So again, these symbols are teaching us to, how to understand the very nature and fabrics of reality. We can, we will go so much deeper. The far, the more you listen, the deeper this will become. I, dot Kesser, to become conscious of itself or to render itself comprehensible to itself. Ayin becomes Ayin Saf, infinity, and still further, Ayin Saf, our, 
absolute limitless light, the di Daiva Prakriti of the Brahman, the Vedantist, and the Adi Buddha, or the Amitabha of the Buddhist, which then by concentration, the Tisensum, according to the Zohar, concentrated itself into a central dimensionless point. Kesar, the crown, which is the first Sephiroth on the Tree of Life. Another way in which the same idea has been expressed is that within the concept of ab abstract negativity, the whirling forces, the Rashish Higolag, the Rashish Hi Ha Gigolim presage in the first manifestation of the primordial point, the Nakura Rishana Rishana, which becomes the primeval root from which all else will spring. Tesser is the inscrutable manad, the root of all things, defined by line meets with reference both to the ultimate nature of physical things and to the ultimate unit of consciousness as a metaphysical point, a center of spiritual energy, unextended and indivisible, full of ceaseless life, activity and force. It is the prototype of everything spiritual and indeed of all else in the cosmos. In this connection, uh, the reader will do well to bear in mind the following extract from the mysterious universe wherein Sir James Jeans write, this show that an electron must in a certain sense at least occupy the whole of space. They, Faraday and Maxwell pictured an electrified particle which drew out lines of force throughout the whole of space. Okay, hold on. The scientific conception of the mathematical electron which occupies the whole of space, which corresponds to the Kabbalistic conception of Kessler in the world of Asiya, the four wor worlds are explained in chapter 7. In the Kabbalah are included what are known as the ten sephiros. There is some little speculation as to what these imply, ten numbers, ten words, or ten sounds. The general implication of Cordovero is that they are sub substantive principles of Kahnim, vessels of force, or categorical ideas through which the consciousness of the universe expresses itself. A metaphorical passage from the Zohar states on that which on that on this point that the waters of the sea are limitless and shapeless, but when they are spread over the earth, they produce a shape. The source of the waters of the sea and the, and the force in which it emits to spread itself over the soil are two things. Then an immense basin is formed by the waters just as, a, as is formed when one makes a very deep digging. This basin is filled by the waters which emanate f as a third thing, this very large hollow of waters is split up into seven canals which are like so many long tubes by means of which the waters are conveyed the source the current the sea and the seven canals form together the number 10 the passage then goes on to explain that the source or primary cause of all things is Kessler the first sephira the current issuing there form the primeval Mercurial intel intelligence is Chukman the second, and the sea itself is the great mother. Bana the third, the seven canals referred to being the seven lower sephiros, are inferiors as they are called the Kabbalist postulated ten sephiros because to them ten was a perfect number one which included every digit without repetition and contained the total essence of all numbers. Isaac Myers writes that 0 to 1 ends with 1 to 0, and Rabbi Moses Cordovero in his Pardis Ramanim manifestation commences with the appearance of a Layla Oh, excuse me.